Grace family, it is time for another wonderful weekend together, and we are so excited to see you today. I'm Chris Pedro. And I'm Maddie, and we just want to personally welcome you to Grace Community Church Online. We are one church in three locations. We have two physical campuses right here in Sarasota, Florida, and we have our online campus where we stream our services every single weekend. We hope to come alongside you as a church family to help you to grow in your walk with Jesus and to deepen your faith with fantastic fantastic biblical teaching. Service will begin very soon, so don't go anywhere. We're about to jump into a full service with an awesome time of worship and wonderful preaching, and you don't want to miss a single second. We also want to encourage you to pop into our chat and say hello to us and your fellow online campus attenders. Wherever you are, we're excited to spend some time with you this weekend, chat with you, and experience church together. So let's take advantage of the time that we have. Our goal every week is to provide you with a meaningful time with God. But even more than just our weekend services here at Grace, we strive to create a culture that is welcoming and inclusive. You can learn all about what we believe and value at Grace by visiting our About page at gracesarasota.com. And one thing that you'll find there is the culture point, Kingdom Come, which means that we see every moment as a potential heaven meets earth moment. Exactly. We believe that part of our calling as Christians is to live out the kingdom of God in the world. And in God's kingdom, we love others radically, we serve passionately, and we share the good news about Jesus everywhere we go. You just never know when doing those things can totally change someone's life for eternity. That's right. Hey, but Grace, it is time for service to begin. Remember that we want this to be more than just an online message. We encourage you to join with your Grace family and engage with us in the chat as we all head into church together. At Grace, we say that you can belong before you believe, so don't feel pressure to be anybody other than yourself. We are so glad that you specifically are here and we hope that God meets you wherever you are. We are praying that God speaks to you in today's service, so let's open our hearts and worship God together. Once again, welcome to Grace and thank you for being here with us. Welcome Grace Community Church. Would you stand and worship with us today? Come on, let's get excited about what God is doing. Darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power but Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name registered in heaven and my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rear up my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony sons and daughters bought with blood and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done.
greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I've testified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We've all felt the pain of this life. We've all been lost at some point. And it's not our works that reconcile us to the Father. It's the finished work of Jesus that gives us salvation, that gives us a purpose, gives us a life worth living. Walk in the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. Feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light in the dead of night. All found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. But there's a better life. Oh, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains He's a chain breaker If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you believe it if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Oh, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Oh, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost. Savior, if you got change, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison 
shaking Savior if you got chains He's a chain breaker We hope that as we sang that last song that you were really able to focus on who God is. Now before we continue in worship, once again, I'm Chris and this is Maddie and we are here to welcome anyone just jumping in here to our online campus. Welcome to Grace. We are so glad that you are here. And even more specifically, we want to take a special moment right now to say hey to any of you who may be checking us out online for the first time or if you are a brand new guest here to Grace. Listen, as a church, we want to give you a huge shout out. It's a big deal to us that you take a part of your weekend to join us virtually today. If that's you, I want to encourage you to drop in on the chat and say hello so we can celebrate you being here with us. And we also would love to connect with you. To help us do that, simply visit gracesarasota.com and click the About tab at the top of the page. On the About tab, you can learn all about who we are as a church and then fill out a form at the bottom of the page so we can send you a free gift. <laughs> Not only that, but you can also use your phone to text the phrase new guest SRQ to 97000. And that will bring up a digital connect card for you to fill out right there on your phone so that we can send you that free gift. Mm -hmm. So please do take advantage of all those things, but the most important thing that we all want you to know is that we are thrilled with excitement to have you here with us today. So welcome. Next, we're going to take a moment to move from worshiping through singing to worshiping Him through our giving. And let me just say, if there is one thing I know, it's that this church is a generous church. Every week, you all are living out our mission to reach the unchurched by being intentional neighbors who reflect Christ. Your giving is going towards more than just keeping the lights on. It's helping change people's lives in the church building, in our surrounding community, and even in different places all over the world. Yeah, so thank you everyone for your generosity and if you've never taken that step before, I want to invite you right now into the journey of generosity. We mentioned one of our culture points at the beginning of this service, but another one is this. We believe in being contagiously outrageous, meaning that we want to be extreme in our love and our generosity towards others just as God has been toward us. And when we give, we get to worship the Lord by bringing Him our very best because we know that everything that we have truly belongs to Him in the first place. So we invite you to trust in the Lord, watch Him move in your life, and see Him use your gift to reach others. And there are many ways that you can do that. So just take a look at the bottom of the screen or use the link provided in the chat. Let's go ahead and pause to pray and ask God to bless the offering this week. Chris. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, God. We thank you for the opportunity to not only worship you in singing, but we worship you in our giving as well. Lord, take everything that we have to offer and multiply it that we might see more people come to you. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Online family, thank you for joining with us in prayer. We're gonna continue in worship, and we just hope that you are ready to celebrate all that God has done in our lives. Let's stand and let's worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like. There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you See hope And holy There is no one like you Cause there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love together I will build and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you on your love, the love that draws us in, that brings us closer to who you are. God, remind us of that first love today. God, remind us 
of the love that gave everything for us. We love you, Jesus. Place just an altar and a flame. Love is found here in our sacred space. I hear your voice, I see your face. You're still my first love. You're still.
Just you Come and have your way So I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you When it's all about you Every voice listed I'm coming Would you, uh, would you just take a moment and put your hand on your heart and we just, uh, let's close our eyes and let's bow our hearts. Lord, we just pause for a moment and what we do when we gather, it really is all about you. And Lord, so often we do try to make it about us. We do want it to be the way we want it to be. We want it to look the way we want it to look. Um, but Lord, the heart of worship is to just lift Jesus up in everything that we do. And I, and I just pray, Lord, that all of us collectively would take a moment. Um, we've all got busy lives. There's all kinds of things going on. I pray that we just take a moment right now to just stop and to tell you that we love you and that worship is about you and that we want our lives to reflect you. We want our families to reflect you. We want our church to reflect you. Lord, we want all of those that are gathered here and even those that are online right now to to truly experience all that you have for us, Lord, as we lift you up. I pray, Lord, for anybody who's struggling, going through difficulty, Lord, going through pains, whatever it may be, I pray, Lord, that you would meet them right now where they are, whether they're watching online or whether they're here, that you'd speak to them and encourage them and love on them. And Lord, I pray that as our hands over our heart as well, I pray that you would speak to us this weekend. I pray, Lord, that as we go to your word and we do our best to study it and to look at it and to rightly divide it. Um, Lord, I pray that somehow by what Paul spoke to the Galatian church many, many, many years ago would find an intersection with the points of our lives right now. And Lord, I pray that nobody would leave here and nobody would tune out online the same way they came in or the same way they tuned in. Lord, I do pray that you would speak to us for your glory. And we're all going to be very careful to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap and tell him that we love him? You go ahead and have a seat. You know, we're continuing in our study in Galatians. And if you're new, we, uh, we're going through uh, Paul's epistle that he wrote to the um, Galatians, um, probably the first piece of Christian literature that we have in the New Testament. And he had traveled in his first missionary journey, amongst other places. He went to the area that we would consider today southern Turkey, and he planted several churches in this area that was called Galatia. And one of the things that he did that made his missionary journey so sort of interesting within the Mediterranean basin and as it reverberated up to Jerusalem is he told people wherever he went, if they would believe in Jesus, that he had died on the cross for their sins and he had risen on the third day, that they could be part of the people of God. And that was a, to say that was a, a shocking statement w w wouldn't be fair for us to, we wouldn't be understanding the first century and specifically Judaism because the Jewish people knew that they were the people of God. And if 
you wanted to be the people of God, you needed to get circumcised, you needed to keep the law, you needed to eat right. And Paul comes into a predominantly Gentile area and tells them they can be part of the people of God by trusting Jesus. Well, that got back to Jerusalem. And some of the early Jewish people who probably were believers in Jesus and, and meant very well, felt like they needed to go down to Galatia and correct what Paul had taught. Paul had this gospel, this euangelion is the Greek term that, that meant good news. And it was a loan word from actually Caesar. When Caesar would come on the scene, a new Caesar would come to power, they would say it's the good news. It's the gospel of Caesar. And the, the early Christians took that word and said, no, the real ruler of the world is Jesus. And the good news is, is that he's come and that he's forgiven sins and you, you, can, you can be made right with God. Well, the Jewish people that, you know, wanted to hold on to some of their Judaism, felt like that Paul was just sort of giving half the story. The other half of the story was, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but you also need to keep the law. You need to get circumcised. You need to, you need to eat by the Levitical standards. And so they came in and started telling this newly found church that had met Jesus that they needed to do a little bit more. They needed to do some other things to make sure they were on the right path. Well, Paul hears about that. And he writes this letter because he's upset. It's furious that anybody would come along and try to change the simple gospel. And so he writes, and we're in, starting in chapter four this, uh, this weekend. And if, you, you know, if you've missed some, you can go back to the mobile app. You can also go online. All of these are there. We want you to avail yourself of that. But in, last week, as we, as we came out of chapter three, and I've said this many, many times, but I wanna make sure we, we, you hear this. There are no chapter divisions in the early manuscripts. They're all one letter like anybody ever remember like in high school writing a letter to somebody that you liked? Remember how that, you didn't do one, 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 two, one, three. Now chapter two, verse one. Those were added and they're great because they help us to memorize things, but sometimes they break the thought and we end our devotion and our chapter and then we pick up a chapter a little bit later and don't see the sequential thought. Well, at the end of chapter three, Paul told the Galatian church that if they were in Christ, they were Abraham's offspring. And if they were Abraham's offspring, they were heirs according to the promise. And so Paul takes this idea of heirs and he continues to riff on it into chapter four. And we're gonna see him sort of take a, a line and, and, and explain what that means and it's, it's beautiful. And then he's gonna talk a little bit about some personal things. And we're gonna move through more verses than we normally do because it sort of lends itself to that. And then at the end, I've got, I really feel two really great intersecting points between what Paul said to them and what it may say to you and me today. And, and, and I think that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be challenged. So let's pick up here in chapter four, verse one. He says, I mean that an heir, as long as he's a child, is no different than a slave. Now, Paul's sort of taking these two terms, heir and a slave, and he's sort of making an analogy. It's, it's not a perfect analogy, but, but, it, but it really does hold up well to make his point. He says, the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. And, and why is that? He says, because he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Point being is that in the first century, you know, fathers would get together and they would decide, what well, we're gonna give you know, th this, this young man he can have his part of the deal at this particular time. And there would be guardians, which are more like babysitters. And there would be managers that, that sort, of, sort of looked over the household economics to get everything to where it needed to be until the time that was set by the father. We see that in today's world. You know, many, many of you all are familiar with trusts and, you know, family can set up a trust and they can say, well, we've got a young kid and that kid, if something were to happen to us or anything, you know, went on, th that, that kid could actually avail themselves of the trust when they're 25 or 27 or 19 or whatever it may be. Everybody can set that date. Paul says, listen, he goes, here's the reality. An heir who really owns everything can't really access that. Sort of like a slave that would like to be free, but can't access that. He says, and, and the heir can only access what is theirs when the time is right. There, there's a certain time in which all of a sudden all that becomes true. And he says, in the same way, we also, so he's linking that to this. He said, in the same way, we also, when we were children, when we were, when we were, you know, and he's using this sort of in a figurative way, saying, you know, before we really understood everything about Jesus and all that stuff, he goes, we were children, he goes, we were enslaved to the elementary principles 
of this world, that, 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 that the world sort of had its hold on us, that, that we really didn't know any better. It just, it's just sort of what it was. We were sort of under its reign, under the guardians and sort of the, 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 the overseers and the managers of just this world, that, that we were sort of bound, bound to that. He says, but when the fullness of time came, there was, a, there was a point where God said, okay, all of this stuff is going to now open up. And he says, in the fullness of time, God is a sovereign God. He knew what he was doing. Can't ever read the Bible and somehow think that maybe God didn't know what he was doing along the way. You know, it's, and it's easy to do that sometimes, right? In the Old Testament, you go, man, what's going on? Everybody's going this way and that way. And God comes in and says, okay, we'll do this. And then there's like a flood and we, whoa, okay. And then there's this and there's Noah and now they're running wild again. And this is going on. And now they're in Egypt. And you know, and, and you, you go like, man, what is, what is going on? But when you pull back and pull back and pull back, God, God had a plan in the fullness of time. He sent forth his son, Jesus who was born of a woman, born under the law. He's also human, even though he's divine, born under the Jewish law. He kept the Jewish law in its, in its fullness because he, he completed everything for you and me. He did all of that for a purpose, to redeem those who were under the law, to redeem a redemption, sort of drawing on that slave imagery. The only way a slave could, could come out of the market was to be redeemed, that he sent his son to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, that we were adopted. I mean, think about that for a second. The God of the universe that created everything has adopted you and me that have believed in Jesus. We're children. Like we're, we're full on his children. Yes, we're adopted, but we're full on and, and this is so beautiful because he says, and because you are sons, like, like for Paul, th there's not really a doubt of whether or not you should know if you're a believer. You're, you're a son. You believed in Jesus, right? You believe he died for your sins. You believe, then you're a son. Like there's just, he just is, he's so sure of that. I love like in Philippians 4, when he's talking about Euodia and Syntyche, which are two women in the church at Philippi that are arguing at the time. He says, their names are in the Lamb's book of life. They're in the book of life. Like he's so certain that, that they're believers. You know, sometimes we wonder if we are, that Paul's like, you, you are. He says, because you're sons, check this out. This is incredible. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That this word Abba is like daddy, like you and me have been adopted and we have the right and the privilege to call upon our heavenly father in a tender and intimate way. He's our dad. He's our daddy. Like, you know, all the time at the house, you know, the kids will call out, mommy, mommy. But every once in a while, they'll call out daddy. Usually is it, is it gets, the, the, whatever the crisis is gets a little worse. It moves from mommy to daddy. I guess they think maybe I'm a little bit more of the disciplinarian and I don't know what it is, but, but, they'll, they'll call it. But, the, but the bottom line is, is it's great. Like, I love it when my kids say, daddy. It's like they, they know that, hey, this guy's gonna help me out. This guy's got an answer. And I don't always have the answer, but they, they see it that way. That Paul says, listen, Jesus came, like, like follow this here. You're an heir. And, and Jesus has come and he has given you his spirit on the inside whereby you and me can cry, Abba, Father. And he says, so you're no longer a slave. Like there, you're, just, you're just not a slave anymore. You're a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir through God. He says, don't you remember? He says, formerly before, you, you didn't know God. When, when that, that, you didn't know God at all. You were enslaved to those things that were by nature no gods. Maybe you don't remember that in your life personally, but Paul would say, everybody, he's writing to the Galatians, like, you may, listen, when you didn't know God, before you came to know God, you were enslaved. Like you had idols of the heart. You had things that got your attention that were not godly and not right. You were enslaved to that. But what's happened is Christ has come and he's set you free. You're, you're, you're no longer a slave. And so he says, but now, that you've come to know God. And I love how Paul says this. He actually thinks he's probably writing because when, when, when he would write these letters, he would have what's called an amanuensis. That's a scribe. And he would dictate 
to the scribe who would write because the scribe knew how to write just the right way because the, the, the stuff they wrote on was pretty expensive. So, you know, you just couldn't just write. That's why if you ever read Paul and at the very end of the letters, he goes, see how big letters I'm writing? That's because he's not a professional scribe. So the letters would get bigger when he would actually start to write because he didn't know how to do so this. This amanuensis, you can see Paul talking and he goes, now that you've come to know God, well, actually rather known by God because that's, that's really what it is, that God knows you and me. I love how he says that. It's just, it's just this great insight to Paul's mind. He says to the Galatian church, okay, let's stop here. You got these people that have come in and told you that you need to go back under the law. He said, let's, let's make it really clear. I've been riffing on this air thing. You know, an air sort of is under guardians and managers until the time comes. Well, the time's come. Jesus has come. And you used to be enslaved. We used to be enslaved. We were Jews. We kept the law. Y'all didn't, but you did. You were enslaved. Everybody was enslaved. Jesus has come to set us free. He's like, how in the world, now that you know God, or more importantly, that God knows you, how in the world can you turn back? How can you, how can you even begin to think that going back under the Jewish law and, and keeping all of those things is somehow going to benefit you? He goes, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? whose slaves you want to be once more? Why would you do that? Why, why would you want to set up a life of failure? Christ has set you free. You, you are his children. You don't have to perform. You know, my kids don't get up every morning and have to do eight things so that I'll call them my children every morning. They don't have to perform for me every morning so that I can go, yeah, I was sort of thinking about getting rid of you, Luke. I know your last name's Bennett, but I was going to go down and change it, man. But, you know, now that you took the trash out, that you did this here and you didn't yell at your sister and you did this just perfect, you can stay in the family for one more day. And a lot of us live that way. We, we live as if we think that we got to perform for God and tap dance. Paul's like, why would you want to go back? Why would you want to do that? He's like, you guys are like now starting to take on the calendars and the festivals and all of that stuff. I mean, it's like, Come on, you, you, don't, you don't have to do those things. You, you're, you're now observing days and months and seasons and years. You'll see, you'll see it from time to time. You hang out in the church long enough, somebody will come along every once in a while and tell you, ah, oh, if you're really a Christian, let me give you the secret sauce here. You gotta keep all these festivals that they used to keep back in the Old Testament. And some people go, oh, wow, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. No, he just told you you don't have to do that. Not me. He's like, why are you guys doing that? Why would you go back to that? Christ is calm. He set, he set you free. He says, I got to be honest. I'm, I'm a little worried at this point that, that I've labored over all of you all in vain. Like, I mean, I, I thought that we had it going on. I thought that I taught you about Jesus, but you guys now want to go get circumcised and you want to go keep the law and you want to eat. Like, you're never, ever going to be okay like that. And then he sort of changes gears here a little bit. He says, okay. He goes, remember when I came to you? Remember when I visited you? I didn't have you eat the way I ate as a Jew, did I? I sat down with you all and hung out with you all. He's like, brothers, become as I am. I became as you are. Like, why would you want to go back? Like, I didn't even bring that to you. And I'm Jewish. Like I was a Pharisee and I didn't bring all this stuff. Be like me because I was like you. And he's like, you did me no wrong. The fact that you all have defected a little bit, it's not personal. I don't take it personal. You do me wrong. You're doing yourself wrong. You're doing your relationship with God wrong. This isn't about me. I'm just Paul. I'm just the messenger. You didn't do me wrong. You're you're hurting yourself by, by doing this. He says, do you remember? Like, go back with me. Do you remember that? When I first came, he goes, it was a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. Do you, you remember? Like I came to you with a problem. We don't know what the problem was. We don't know if it was like a sickness or a disease. We don't know if Paul got beat up really bad. But what we do know is this. We know that it was so significant that whatever this bodily ailment was, Paul says, and though my condition was a trial to you. However, Paul stumbled into Galatia, it wasn't in a good scene. They had to tend to him. 
And it was, and it was a trial. I mean, in other words, it cost them something. They didn't even know this guy. He shows up, he's not doing well. We don't know if he's sick, if he was beaten up. We just don't know. We just had a bodily ailment. We don't know. People speculate. But the bottom line, it was a trial. And he said, don't you remember? You didn't scorn or despise me. You received me as an angel of God. Is Christ Jesus. Like you, we were like, what happened? We were, we were close. And you guys listened to me and you learned about Jesus. And now somebody's come along and pulled you another direction. He's like, what became of your blessedness? What became of the kindness that you extended to me? He goes, I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. What's that mean? Well, we, we use the phrase, you've heard it. You know, that person would give his left arm for that girl. It's, it's a phrase. It's a phrase that, that these people would have done something. He's not saying they would have literally galloped, but it was, it's, a, it's, a, it's an affectionate phrase. It goes back to some early playwrights, probably in the first century where, where lines, you know, like if I say, may the force be with you, you all know what that means because that's like a movie scene. Okay, well, there were plays back then and, and they went and saw them. And this idea of gouging out your eyes meant like the most brotherly love. Some people say that means Paul had eye problems and, and that was his bodily. It could be, could be. I don't, I don't think that's the case though. I think what he's saying here is that I don't, I don't get it. Like you guys would have given your left arm for me at one point. He says, so I got to ask you, have I become your enemy? because I told you the truth. I told you how to get right with God. And you guys are like defecting. You wanna go back into all these other things. Why, why do you wanna do that? He says, let's make it really clear here. He says, they make a lot about you. They tell you all good kinds of good things. Oh, you're great, whatever. He says, but it's not really for a good purpose. There's people that'll say a lot of good things to you and make you feel a good way and manipulate you and get you, but it's, this is, they're not doing it for a good purpose. Actually, what they want to do is they want to shut you out. They really want to keep you away because if you really understood what Judaism was and you understood how that stuff worked and you understand where I was at and, and now meeting Jesus, really <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to keep you apart. Like even if you went to the temple, there was a barrier that says Gentiles cannot walk any further. He says, we're going to shut you out. So you've got to make much of them. You're going to need them. He's like, come on, follow me here. He says, it's good to be made of. It's good if somebody loves on you. It's good if somebody's kind to you, if it's for a good purpose. And he says, and not only when I'm present with you, because he's not present anymore. He says, but my little children, when I'm present, he goes, but I'm not with you, but I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That, that for Paul, the greatest pastoral thing he could do for the local church is to see Christ formed in them. And he labored over them. You can see the intimacy. You can see the pastoral heart of Paul here. And he says, I really wish I could be present with you and change my tone. I, I know I'm writing a little hard here to you. And I know I'm, I'm stepping on the gas a little bit, but I'm doing it because I care, and, and, and I want to make sure that you're being formed properly and you understand what it means to be children of God. He says, but I got to be honest. I'm perplexed. I, I'm, I'm struggling. Anybody who's ever done ministry can relate to that. You, 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 some, oftentimes, you're perplexed. You, you, you love on people. Some of you all have done it with your families. You've done it with people that you know. You love people and you try to care for people, and you try to do what's right, and off they go. And you go, what? What happened? Paul's like, I'm perplexed. So as I looked at those verses, I, I, I sort of, for the last week, just sort of in my mind, was trying to wrestle with what's in here that intersects so much with us right now? And that's part of reading scriptures. You wanna read what was said and then you wanna say, how does that apply now? Well, the first thing is I was sort of noodling and thinking about this passage that came to my mind, and, I, and I'll explain what I mean once I tell you the point, and I think you'll, you'll follow me here in just a minute, is that circumstances cannot limit the power of the gospel. Let me explain what I mean here. 
Paul tells us in this passage very clearly that he came to them and preached the gospel with a bodily ailment, and I'm only going to use the first couple of words in the next verse, that was a trial to them. So let's think about this for a second. Paul came to the Galatian church with something that was so critical that it really was a trial for those people in Galatia to help him out. Now, if you and me were thinking about this, and I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a big revival and we're gonna have all these people come and I'm gonna show up on a hospital bed with an IV and have to have everybody get around me and give me CPR and all this stuff. You'd go, that probably wouldn't be the greatest way to preach the gospel, right? Okay, Paul shows up with a bodily ailment that is a trial to them and it didn't matter. The gospel still worked. See, see, the gospel is an uncaged lion. The gospel doesn't need the right circumstance to work. And this is something that we've got to get through our bones, in our bones and in our spirit right now in the world that we live in. The church and the gospel and Jesus don't need a certain society to work They'll work anywhere. The gospel works anywhere. And, and what we've done is we've, we've convinced ourselves that, oh, well, we've got to have it this way and that way because if they take this or do this or do that, what will happen is, is the church will get beat up or whatever else. L- let, me, let me tell you, let me give you some good news. Church isn't going anywhere and the gospel doesn't need any circumstance whatsoever to work. It works wherever it is preached. And if you, if you don't believe that, l- l- let me give you some other biblical things from Paul. So Paul's probably in Ephesus prison. We, we don't know for sure, but he's in prison. And he writes to the church at Philippi. And if you know anything about Paul, everywhere Paul goes, it's either a riot or a revival. He's either in jail or people are getting saved. I mean, it's just, it's just as simple as that. That was Paul's life, okay? He's in and out of jail and people are getting saved. I mean, that's just Paul's life. Paul writes to the church at Philippi He's in prison. They're worried that he's in prison. They're worried, hey man, our quarterback is in prison. How's he gonna get the ball to everybody? We need to get him out of prison, man, so he can go preach. Here's what Paul says. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Like I'm in prison, but it don't make a difference, man. The gospel's like cascading down and the praetorian guards coming to Jesus and it's working and all kinds of stuff. And then people are going off and doing other stuff. He's like, man, I know it doesn't look really good, but what's happened is actually advancing the gospel because the gospel's not bound. The gospel doesn't need an ism to work. It doesn't need the right legislation to work. It doesn't need the right environment. The gospel works anywhere it is preached, wherever. And, 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 and we're so wrapped up in, we got to get the circumstances right so that we can, can do. But the reality is, is that, so Paul, let's check this out. Paul is in prison. This is probably the last letter Paul wrote. It's during Nero's reign. Paul knows he's going to die. He knows at any moment they're going to call him up and he's going to be beheaded. Here's what he writes. Remember Jesus. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's the part where he says, we need to get Nero out? He doesn't. Where's the part where he says, we need to, he doesn't. He didn't care about those things. They're not important to him. He says, remember Jesus, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel, for which I'm suffering, bound with chains is a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. It's not. And I want us to take for a moment from Paul who comes in maybe the worst possible, I mean, you you roll in to be the evangelist on your missionary journey, 
and you flop in with a bodily ailment that's costing everybody and is a big issue for everybody and is a trial for everybody, you'd go, it's probably not the best way to come into town. You're right. But the gospel doesn't need the right environment. The gospel just needs us to be faithful to tell it. When we tell people about Jesus, it works. It doesn't need a setup, although it's great. Get to know people, invite them to places, have lunch with them, do all those things. I'm all all for that, but I want you to know something. The gospel doesn't need that. All the gospel needs is somebody to faithfully speak it. So let let me encourage you that the church ain't going anywhere and the gospel ain't going anywhere because Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is. Second, and I've I've been saying the entire time, the book of Galatians is really about the exodus. It's about deliverance. He says, you've been delivered from the present evil age in chapter one, verse four, and he calls them the Israel of God in Galatians 6, 16. Second thing I wanna say is this, never underestimate. And, And if you're here right now, you're tuned in, you're not here by accident. Never underestimate ever the power of God's deliverance. Paul says it very clear that in the fullness of time, he sent Jesus for a purpose to redeem us, that we could be adopted, that, that, that he came to get us out of the slavery that we were under and to give us freedom. And, and I, I often sit just as a Christian, but even as, as your pastor, I, I sit and I ask these questions quite often. What, what hinders us? from experiencing all that God has for us. Why when we read the New Testament, oftentimes we go, it doesn't really seem like that's going on for us or for me. Why is that the case? What, what may hinder us? This is not exhaustive, but, but, I, but I, I want you to just maybe allow God to do a little bit of surgery on you. You may not have come here for that, but, but, but I want you to just, Think about it. I mean, all this whole epistle is about the freedom and the deliverance that God has given to his children. And Paul doesn't want anybody to not live in that freedom. What are some things that might hinder you and me from really experiencing all that God has? The first thing I think of, and and this is what I call it, the psychologists call it um, um, bad self-talk. I call it stinking thinking. Okay, and, 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 and my list is not exhaustive, but I think some of you all will go, ooh, yeah. How about, it's too late. Chip, look, I'd love to walk in all God's doors. It's just too late, man. I mean, life sort of passed me by. Like, you, you know, I mean, it's great. I mean, I know you're up there and, and it's, you know, and, and you probably mean well and you really do want to try to help us out. But man, it's just, it's just too late, man. It's too late for me. Or you don't understand, man, I, I've messed up. I mean, I, I mean, I have messed up. Like I'm sure some people in here have messed up, but you don't know what I've done. And, 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 and I would love to walk in all of God's deliverance, but I've messed up. I don't have what it takes, man. You don't understand. I hear you telling me to tell people about Jesus, but you know, I'm, I'm an introvert, man. I mean, I, like, I, I can't even, I don't even wanna answer my phone. I mean, I, I, I don't even wanna talk to anybody. You know, I mean, on Halloween, I just put candy out and shut the door. I didn't even like say hi or anything or just take two. I just said, whatever you got, I'm out. And I went and watched The Bachelor. I don't know. Don't watch that. It's terrible stuff. Anyway, <laughs> let, me, let, let, me, let, me try, let me let me show you what Paul says. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth and he's trying to get them in line. Like he's trying to get the Galatian church in line. Listen to what he says to them. He says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Are you you doing that in your life? I'm not here to give you a guilt trip. Our church is not guilt community church, it's grace, okay? So I'm not here to give you a hard time, but I wanna ask you, you you really taking every thought captive? Like when you go, you don't understand, it's too late. Are you, are you, you changing that with Lazarus was dead for four days. 
With God, it's never too late because he's a God of resurrection. Like, we, we, we got to change the way we think. You go, I've messed up. The apostle Peter would go, get in line. I denied the guy three times, and he said, go get him. See, I don't have what it takes. Nobody does. God doesn't call people who've got it together. He helps you get it together after he calls you. He gives you capable power. No, nobody does. I mean, I, I mean I'll, I'll be vulnerable. I mean, I can't tell you in the time of Grace Community Church, in the 11 years that we've done this, I can't even begin to even count how many times I've quit. It's done. Can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I, I just don't want to do this. I mean, I, 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 this was not what I expected. I mean, this is honest heart. When we started this church, I thought if this church would get to 300 people in five years, we would have killed it. I never had, ever had. I mean, I, I grew up in a town of 6,600 people. Like if you had 50 people at church, that was something else. I mean, the, the church I grew up in, I mean, a church of 500 people was huge. It's like mega church. I never, ever, I never think, being more, even more vulnerable, I didn't even come out of my office last Saturday night because I thought I really had preached the worst message I had ever spoken my entire life. Went back and sat in my office with my just hit and I called Mindy. I'm like, it was is terrible. It's the worst ever. I'm like, I don't even know how I do. I'm like, I, I'm like, I don't even, why do these people even show up? Like, this is the worst, you know, and, 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 and granted, don't, 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 you don't need to get worried. I, I get myself back in line and I have to speak to myself too. And I have to talk about what God says. But sometimes I wonder if we do more damage to ourselves in experiencing all God has for us, because we just can't say the things that God says about us to ourselves. Can I tell you something? Hear me. Your heavenly father loves you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. And the best for you is not what culture says the best is. The best for you is to be conformed to the image of his son. But he wants you to truly be all that you can be in him. He wants you to be able to go through difficulty with joy. He wants you to know how to suffer with praise. He wants you to be able to see the miraculous and not get puffed up but he loves you. He loves you in ways that you could never even imagine. Don't, don't live or don't miss living in the freedom that God has for you because of bad self-talk. Or how about this? How about unrepentant sin? You know, you're like, oh man, I don't know. I need to get out of here now. I thought, I thought Chip preached nice stuff. I promise you this, if you come to grace long enough, you're gonna get it all. I don't, I don't pick and choose parts of the Bible that I think you'll like. I, I, I just try to be honest. Unrepentant sin, let me, let me try to make it in a non-Christian language because that's very Christianese. That means that you've not made up your mind that God's way is the right way and you keep missing his way because the word repent means to change your mind. So you've not changed your mind. Sin means to miss the mark. So you keep missing the mark because you've decided to do it your way rather than God's way. I can tell you that so many believers miss living in all the things that God has for them because they don't want to do it God's way. And, and we, we're seeing it in the world today. God has, I mean, and, and, God, and God doesn't do what, he doesn't give us what he says about certain things because he's trying to be onerous or difficult or whatever else. His way is just the best way, period. And, and he's kind and he's gracious. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna read what Paul says, just so that, and, and you, can just, you can just marinate on this and I'll, I'll leave this. He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Are you, are you not aware that God's kindness is to me, meant to lead you to do it his way? Like he's kind and gracious. He's trying to, get you and me on the right 
page because he knows that there's a way that seems right to you and me, but it ends in a bad way. It ends in death. And I love Solomon, in case you miss it, in 14.12, says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends there of death. He's like, oh, you missed 14.12? 16.25. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end there is death. Like if you missed it in 14, you get it in 16 if you're reading Proverbs. He says, God's kindness is to get you to change your mind about the way you're living. And he says, Sir, but because of your heart and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Like God wants you and me to live in freedom and victory, but sometimes we just, we're not gonna give in. We're gonna do it our way. No matter what scripture says, no matter what scripture says about things, we're gonna do it our way. And I'm telling you, that's not gonna live, get you to the point where you wanna be. How about this? How about idols? Can we talk about that for a moment? Like idols are talked about a lot in the Old Testament. You know, the bad kings would put up idols and people would worship them. The good kings would come in and tear them down. M- m- maybe many of us. But Paul says it. He says, this right here, he says, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to those things that are by nature no gods. Those are idols. How many things in our lives do we idolize? I, I can tell you, you want to know, because I'll, I'll tell you how it is. You want to know the things that have your heart. Find the things that have you go tick, tick, boom in two seconds. Those are the things that have your heart. If you flip on TV and somebody says something that you don't like and you're enraged, you got an idol. Somebody does something and you, you, you don't agree with what, the, the, the person that should get all of our heart and all of our affection is not those things, it should be Jesus. And, and, and that sometimes keeps us from walking in the fullness of God. Unforgiveness, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because some of us are like, man, I wanna forgive that person. You don't have to raise your hand, but if I did, some of you'd be like, amen. I mean, forgiveness is tough. But what I can tell you is, is when Jesus says, if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. I can tell you at the very least what that means. At the very least, if, if, you, if, if, you, if you're not giving people forgiveness, you're not gonna have, you're gonna be the one bound up. You're gonna be the one that's bound. And we know that. I mean, you know, when we can't forgive somebody, we're the ones that, that lose on that. How about obedience? Just actually doing, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm convinced in America that the majority of the people who go to church in America know more scriptures than they do. Right? Like we know things that we go, yeah, I don't really wanna do that one. Obedience. Like we forget sometimes the if then, if then. And can I tell you something that's maybe shocking to you, but obedience is the real sign of Christian maturity. It's not how many times you've been in church or how many small groups you've led or anything like that. The sign of Christian maturity is whether or not we obey God. Jesus didn't say, blessed are if you know. He didn't say, blessed are if you've been around church for 50 years. He says, blessed are those who do what I tell them to do. It's obedience. Or how about this one? And this is one, we'll, we'll end with this. How about prayer? I mean, and I'm not, again, this is not, if you take this as me being snarky or trying to give you a hard time, you're missing my heart here. I'm just saying, honestly, do we pray? Do, you know, or is, that, is, that, is that a staple of our lives? It's tough, right? And, and you, know, you know why I'm so big on all this stuff? I'm so big on all this stuff because I, I, I want everybody at Grace to truly walk and all that they have for God, because I know that if we start walking in all the things that God has for us, it's gonna spill over. And and can I tell you what the world needs more than anything right now? It needs the church to spill over. It needs needs Jesus to be coming out of these doors and rolling down the Lakewood Ranch Boulevard and down into downtown and into Marina Jack and, and people who are eating salmon on the Marina Jack riding on the boat get saved. I mean, we just need... You know, the salmon's terrible on that boat too. Um, but, but, uh, um, but, but, but the point is, is that I, I just, I, I, I want that for us. I want that for you. I want you to walk in the fullness of what God has because when that happens, things start to change and it is electric. And, and I just, I don't know. I hear so many negativities. I've already, somebody's like, hey, it's time to go. It's time to eat. Um, I hear so many negativity, things that are negative right now. 
people all worried about everything and everything else. I, I'm like, man, I, I wish with everything within me, God, that I could get the people that hear what I say every weekend. I wish I could get them off of that stuff and on to what you want us to be doing and how you want us to impact a community and how you want us to do something great. I, I just believe that the, the days of the church doing something great are, are still ahead of us. I, I don't believe that, that, that there's not great things to still be done. I don't, I don't believe that there's not still souls to be saved. I don't think we need to shut the doors of the church and go buy some freeze dried food and hang out in here for a while. I, th I think that there's more to be done, but I think that it's gonna really take us changing some of the ways that we think and to be like Paul. And to just go, it doesn't make a difference what circumstance I'm in. It doesn't make a difference. I've learned that no matter whatever circumstance I'm in, I can be content. I've learned the secret. It, does, it doesn't make a difference whether it's food, not food, clothes, not clothes, in prison, not prison, whatever goes on in my life. I know that the Jesus in me is greater than all of those other things. And if I draw strength from him, I can go through anything and keep t telling people about him. I want us to be at that place that circumstances don't move us. Circumstances are just opportunities to tell more people about Jesus. So let's, let's pray. Father, I, I, I do my best that I possibly can every weekend, which is probably not that great. But at the end of the day, um, God, I just, I, I pray that the church would hear the heart of the gospel, would hear the heart of what it is that you want us to be as your people. And I pray that you would assemble us, Lord, in a way that we never could have even imagined, to do things that we could have never even dreamed of, to reach people in the amounts that we could never even have fathomed. Lord, all for your glory. Let, let the church arise. Let us not be downtrodden and fear-based and speaking negative stuff over our hearts and holding stuff in and not being willing to forgive. Lord, let us step through that stuff and make that step forward right now for you. And Lord, I pray that you would can just start to move us, give us a fire, give us an excitement. Lord, to be the people that you've called us to be for your glory and for your honor. Would you stand with us? We're gonna sing one last final song. And, and, and I just pray that we would sing this collectively with faith and sing it as a statement to the Lord for his glory.
Wow, wasn't that an awesome time together? Here at our church, we want more for you than just a good experience. But instead, we pray that you have a genuine encounter with Jesus. And we want you to know that if there is anything that we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, if you would like to pray with someone, or if you want to share something from today's service that was really impactful to you, we would love to hear from you. Either send an email to grace at gracesarasota.com, or you can call the number that's on the screen and in the chat. We are a church family, and we really would love to hear from you. Also, to anyone here right now as a new guest with us, we want to meet and connect with you. To help us do that, simply visit gracesarasota.com and click the About tab at the top of the page. On the About tab, you can learn all about who we are as a church and then fill out a form at the bottom of the page so we can send you the free gift we've been talking about. Guys, you can also use your phone to text the phrase new guest SRQ with no spaces to 97000 and that will bring up a digital connect card for you to fill out right there on your phone. All that being said, Grace family, it is now time for all of us to go out and reach the unchurched by being those intentional neighbors that God is calling us to be. We love you and are praying for you. We can't wait to see you again next time. And don't forget to invite a friend. And as always, thanks so much for joining us here at Grace, where everyone is welcome. Bye.